Uh, but now for this next item about climate change, I was going to get campaigning kid Greta Thunberg to enlighten me with her strident teenage views. Uh, but luckily, in the nick of time, I realised she's an intensely irritating adolescent and I changed my mind. Uh, if you're listening, Greta, I know what you're thinking. How dare you? How dare you? But never mind, Greta, I've got a much more interesting guest, and he's an adult. Uh, writer, author and columnist for The Spectator magazine, James Dellingpole. Hello, James. I'm not sure whether I am an adult, but go on. Uh, well, you're a bit more of an adult than Greta Thunberg. <laughs> I know. You should, I think you should have on. Have you come across Naomi Zeibt, the, the, the anti-Greta, I called her? Oh, yes, 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 yes. German girl, yeah. Very brave girl. I mean, you know, Greta gets kind of guaranteed front pages in all the media. Poor Naomi Zeibt gets, gets kind of rape threats from leftists. It's, it's awful. And, th- and this is the state of the world that, that we're, we're dealing with, that, yeah. that this, this, this climate craze. Well, I wanted to get you on because uh, we've been doing a lot about, uh, uh, we've been very London-centric, breaking all the broadcasting rules, but we live in London, uh, about the, you know, Khan's, uh, Mayor Khan's cycle madness, trying to turn half the city into a cycle path, and, and this is apparently going to uh, save us all because we're in a climate change emergency. Now, uh, I... I don't dispute the fact that our climate is changing, but then again, it always has changed. Uh, are we in an emergency? Um, I would say not. <laughs> As you say, the, the, the climate's been changing for four and a half billion years. Um, the, there's nothing that's happened in our lifetime that suggests that we're about to fall off the edge of a cliff. You know, it's. I mean, you look outside, you've got some lovely sunny weather well we have where i am i imagine it's the same in london oh, yeah. yep. and and i'm thinking this is fantastic i'm thinking this is the best spring early summer we've, we've ever had that i can remember that's what i said Jay. i said that the, the coronavirus crisis is the story that kept the weather off the front page yeah it is <laughs> I, and, and actually i wonder whether the, the coronavirus um whether whether things might have turned out very differently if we hadn't had this weather, I think a lot more people would be agitating to get back to work and would you know I think we've been having a fantastic holiday. Mm. Um, it's like going abroad. Mm. We've been really lucky. But but yeah, that's it's, it's weather doing what weather does. Sometimes it's really good and sometimes it's really horrible. But it's nothing to destroy the global economy for. If I may say so, I think that the masterstroke, I'm reluctant to uh, concede this, but I think the masterstroke of Extinction Rebellion and the Green Mob uh, was to add the word uh, emergency to climate change. Uh, 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 that's what's changed uh, the ballpark. Uh, and, and so we're now told, oh, 10 years to save the planet. By the way, 10 years to save the planet, that's, that doesn't sound like an emergency. I mean, I don't phone up the fire brigade and say, uh, I think my house might burn down in a decade. Can you get around here now? Uh, but uh, it is a clever move by them. But tell us why you don't think it is an emergency. Well, it's quite interesting, actually, the, the point you make there, that, it, that it's really about semantics, about changing semantics. So you remember it started off as, as, as global warming. And then they had to change that when the planet, planet stopped, stopped warming. There was a, there was a, long, a long pause. And so they, they, they changed it to this, to this thing called climate change, which covered all bases, so that when it was snowing, it was a sign that, that actually the planet was, was, um, was doomed. When it was raining, the, the, the planet was doomed. So any, any form of, of extreme weather event suddenly became grist to their mill. The climate emergency is just them ramping it up again. The, it's interesting, the, the comparison with, with the coronavirus. I mean, the, the reason that we're locked down, we've been locked down for, what is it, 10 weeks now, yeah. is that um, the government decided to base its policy on the computer model from Imperial College. Um, oh, in the yeah. same way, I mean, Neil Ferguson. Neil, the Neil Ferguson. The, the, the bonking the, the, boffin. <laughs> the bonking boffin, multiply discredited. I mean, you know, yeah, the useless uh, bonking boffin who, who <laughs> never gets anything right. Exactly. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that, that there are lots of Neil Fergusons, lots and lots of them, in the world of climate change predictions. And they've all got these computer models which are, which are projecting climate doom. None of these models have been um, borne out 
by real world data. In fact, the longer time has gone on, the more the real world evidence has diverged from the computer models to the point where we're now recognizing that the computer models are pretty useless. But you've got a very powerful propaganda industry, a green propaganda industry, which continues to pretend that the, mo that the models are valid. Well, there you've got a problem because the, the, the greeners are telling you one thing. Reality is, is telling you another thing. Who do you believe, the green movement or reality? There's, uh, there's a problem right now, I think, uh, if you're skeptical about uh, uh, um, the uh, emergency nature of our alleged climate change crisis, uh, and that is that the lockdown, uh, the green mob have seized on this uh, the opportunistically. Uh, cl it's cleaner air, no traffic, very few flights. This is what they want they, our lives to be like. They want us yeah. to live in perpetual lockdown, don't they? They, they do. And of course, it, it has been helpful to their course degree. You know, there's, there's all these kind of, um, all these propaganda stories about, look at the canals of Venice. Look how, how you can finally see the fish in them. And isn't it marvellous that you can see so far into the distance? Yeah, this stuff is nice, but what you forget is that actually it entails shutting down the global economy. It means that, that millions of people are going to lose their jobs. Thousands of businesses are going to close. And it's those businesses which pay for people's pensions, it pays for their health care, it pays for their holidays, which I'm sorry, we are still going to want to take when this is all over. So I, I, I think there's something, there's something um, anti-human about the green philosophy. All the things that we enjoy doing, they want to stop us doing in order to save the planet. Well, not that it will save the planet, of course. It's not going to make any difference, really. I, th I think uh, that uh, a lot of climate change protesters, the people who park on bridges and uh, bring London to a standstill, uh, uh, I mean, climate change is the cover uh, what they really want to do is to sort of destroy the capitalist system. That's, that's right. That, that, I mean, when I, 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 a few years ago, I wrote a book called Watermelons. And what I set out to do was ask the question, OK, so if these people are, if, if the science isn't accurate, that all these people's claims about global doom are, are inaccurate, what's the motivation for all these different groups, the, the, the greenies and the politicians and, the, and the, the, you know, the people involved in the wind industry and so on? What, what's their motivation? And, OK, part of it is, is definitely follow the money. There is so much money swirling around in, in, in the climate industrial complex. But partly it is, it is as you say, this kind of misanthropic, um, anti-capitalist, anti anti-growth, anti-prosperity view of the world. They don't like us to have plenty. They don't like us to have choice. They want us to go live in caves and you know, travel <laughs> around in coracles and horses and carts. What do you feel about, about this sort of strange cult of the child that seems to surround uh, this teenager, Greta Thunberg? This, this, this is a... You look at this happening throughout history. Um, it was big you, in uh, Maoist China, wasn't it? In Maoist China, well, you look at, you look at the Hitler Youth... The, the, Totalitarian move movements love to co-opt children because children are pure. Children are, are uncorruptible. Children have this, uh, a bless with this, this vision. And, of course, they are the future. So they're the perfect propaganda tool. They're also, of course, very malleable by adults behind the scenes. I mean, Greta Thunberg, for example, I think is heavily influenced by her parents. And there's a, there's a, there are... There's a sort of business interest um, connected to to uh, Greta. She's not she's not this innocent child who just appeared from nowhere to show us the way. She is kind <laughs> of a, a controlled creature to show us the light. Yes, uh, I mean what I think is the thing about climate change, and this is why uh, Extinction Rebellion and the Green campaigners uh, do quite well. Is if you go up to anyone and says you, uh, and say, "Are you worried about the climate about climate change? Are you worried about the future of the planet?" They're not ex exactly likely to turn around and say, "No, I don't give a damn." Uh, do you care about f children in the future? No, I don't care. People are never going to say that. So there's a difference between what they say. Uh, in surveys, etc., and actually what they do. I notice that right now there's a lot of people uh, rushing to try and still get a holiday uh, on a jet uh, to the Mediterranean. 
Yes, and if somebody can tell me how to do that and where the best place to do it is, I, I'd love to hear it because this is what I'm thinking now. In fact, it's got to be half the country's thinking this way. We've all been we've all been going stir crazy with our with our terrible families <laughs> in, our, in our houses that we used to love and now we realize they're like prisons and we definitely definitely want a bit of kind of calamari by the sea don't we by the med absolutely absolutely one last point for you go james uh the spectator the new issue of the spectator that you write for has got a very powerful leader today that makes a lot of sense it cites norway uh, which went into serious lockdown. And now the government has looked at the uh, efficacy of that lockdown and conceded it may have been a complete waste of time. What the spectator is saying is, at the very least, uh, Boris Johnson and the government, they owe us uh, a uh, transparency about this they need to give us the facts because as things stand, we don't know uh, whether or not the lockdown has had any effect at all. Yes. I think that this is the biggest mistake that any, any government has made in history. And it's not just our government, it's governments across the world. It's certainly the worst peacetime disaster. It's the worst unforced error. They've, they've, um, they've contracted out the decision on our economy, on our, on, on our well-being, to a bunch of unaccountable scientists who, it, it seems, uh, have been really unreliable. And they've, they've sold us a pup. I don't think that this... Well, I think the evidence is going to show this, that, that COVID-19 is really no worse than a bad bout of seasonal flu. We've never locked down the economy uh, in the past. This is, this is uncharted territory, and I think th there's going to be a world of pain ahead of us, and I hope that heads roll for the bad decisions which have been made. I think it was very difficult for Boris and the gang. Uh, this is unprecedented and extraordinary, uh, but uh, I agree with the spectator. They are... He, has, he is going to have to be open with us and tell us uh, the truth. Was this lockdown even worth it? Did it? We don't know. It's no, any I, I, I do like what I think on that, on that one. I think, look, I don't... Had we been in the shoes of Boris Johnson 10 weeks ago, I think we too might have been panicked into abandoning our, our pursuit of the Swedish model, abandoning this kind of more relaxed policy. I can understand why at the time, on the available evidence, they, they were scared. But... The mistake they're making now is, is a heap of new evidence has emerged, which shows that it was the wrong policy. And yet still they're talking about this nonsensical two-meter rule. They're not opening the pubs. They should be opening the economy right now. N no beating about the bush. None of this, don't do anything until Monday. None of this, well, restaurants can't open until mid-June or whatever it is. That's ridiculous. We need to get back to work now. Uh, I, I, of course, uh, like Emily Maitlis, I must remain very impartial, but I totally agree with you. <laughs> Thank, thanks very much, James. Uh, that was uh, James Delegpole, the economist and climate change sceptic. He's not a sceptic about China, climate change. He's a sceptic about uh, the uh, notion that we are in an emergency. James Delegpole there.